Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. Hope you are all doing well. My name is Jake Kirkham. I am a recently graduated undergrad from Princeton, and I am super excited to be presenting our paper, Foundations of Empirical Memory Model Testing for GPUs, alongside my fellow authors, Dr. Essen Terechi and Professor Margaret Martinosi from Princeton, and Professor Tyler Sorensen from UC Santa Cruz. Now, as you may have guessed from the title of our paper, our ultimate aim is to improve the way that vendors and developers of graphics processing units, or GPUs, test and verify the implementations of GP memory models and compilers. In practice, that aim boils down to one concrete goal, observing interesting behaviors reliably. To see the challenges presented by this goal, let's dive right into the process of empirical testing. Now, we're going to be looking at two competing approaches to illustrate the problems we're trying to tackle. First, the industry approach to testing, currently used to verify that hardware and compiler implementations conform to frameworks such as OpenCL or Vulkan, and the testing approach recommended in a very influential and frankly really great 2015 paper and dataset, GPU Concurrency Weak Behaviors and Programming Assumptions, which we will call the Allglave dataset, uh, after the first author, authored by a group of researchers, including our very own Professor Tyler Sorensen. Now, to start, we need to define what exactly we're testing, and what the outputs of that testing mean. In our case, we use litmus tests, which are short snippets of concurrent code with a set of possible outcomes, each of which corresponds to a specific ordering in which the code appeared to execute. Here's one such test, named store buffering, in which possible outcomes include printing Princeton Tigers, Tigers Princeton, or nothing at all, depending on the order of execution. That is, does 1 execute, then 2, then 3, then 4, 1, 3, 2, 4, etc. Now we can already see a divergence here between the industry approach and the academic approach. The Vulcan test suite includes two litmus tests for memory model conformance, whereas the Allglave dataset looked at over 10,000 tests. Obviously, this is a much more comprehensive but time-consuming approach. We haven't yet defined what exactly we mean by interesting. Let's consider, for example, an execution where thread 1's instructions execute in order, that is 1, 2, and then thread 2's instructions execute in order, that is 3, 4. Is this interesting? Well, not really. This is an intuitive, allowed execution. Instead, let's look at the case where each thread's second instruction appears to execute before the first instruction, that is 2, 1, 4, 3. This reordering of instructions within each thread, which is a whole lot less intuitive and can be confusing for users, is what we call a weak behavior, and this is the set of behaviors that we're interested in for this paper. While there's a lot to be said, far too much for this presentation, about why we care about weak behaviors, the short story is that although weak behaviors are usually allowed by default, they need to be disallowable by the user, and if a bug does exist, we can often see it manifest in illegal weak behaviors. We need to keep in mind also that in industry use, the primary goal of testing is to verify implementations and find bugs, whereas researchers are also interested in benchmarking and cataloging the overall behaviors of GPUs, and these different aims can tint the way that we view interesting. Now finally, we need to run our tests, and there's a few more considerations here, some of which we will talk about later in more detail. First off, we need a high enough iteration count so that we see a wide range of behaviors, but we also want it low enough so that it doesn't take all day. We need to stress the GPU to induce it to show interesting behavior at all, and we're going to talk a bit more about what that means later. And finally, we need lots of tests, lots of different chips, and a whole lot of different testing scenarios. And again, we can see some direct trade-offs here. While a researcher may be happy to test the GPU for a week of runtime, production testing environments need fast, efficient runtimes. Now currently, this leads to a big gap between approaches. Industry standards have a few tests, short runtimes, and no stress. This is fast, but it's not really effective. On the other hand, researchers often employ inefficient, sometimes unwieldy approaches that might not be very aggressive in their optimizations. Furthermore, we conducted a preliminary meta-study of the Allglave dataset, and we identified a number of concerns that hurt statistical confidence in the results. 
We found non-reproducible weak behaviors when repeated, uh, hours of unnecessary iterations, and a significant portion of expected false negatives, that is, weak behaviors that are possible but not observed, uh, if the experiment was repeated. All of these issues create industry skepticism towards academic empirical testing methods, so the real question we're going to look at is how can we efficiently and reproducibly test these GPU memory models to create an effective, efficient, and importantly, reproducible novel testing paradigm that can bridge this gap. Now let's talk about our paper's areas of exploration and some concrete contributions, and we can split our goal into several smaller quandaries. We'll start with one of exploration. How rare are weak behaviors? Our initial contribution in this development is a new GPU litmus testing tool. The motivation here is that we wanted to execute tests with fine-grained control over what and how we're testing. Such a tool needs to be portable. In our case, we developed an OpenCL, a multi-platform graphics framework. It needs to be configurable with easily swappable tests and really precise control over the test environment. And it needs to be capable of memory stress, which is a technique shown by prior work to be absolutely vital to showing uh, interesting behaviors wherein a whole lot of memory operations run concurrently to the litmus test. And as a quick aside, this tool is now available on GitHub and it's already been deployed by a couple of other researchers, which is really exciting. The exact way in which we stress the GPU, for instance, whether we randomize which threads are assigned to testing and which are assigned to stressing, or whether we force synchronization of the different test threads through a barrier, have direct measurable effects on the number of weak behaviors a given test exposes over a certain number of iterations. We call these options parameters, and we introduce eight total parameters. We call a set of specific values for each parameter a parameter set. With eight parameters, each of which has several options, that gives us 737,000 total parameter sets to test. Now this allows us to reframe our goals into two more questions. Which parameter sets are most effective at exposing weak behaviors, and how can we efficiently find those parameter sets? Now, with a search space of multiple tests, multiple chips, and lots of parameter sets, we can't exhaustively search for the optimum. Instead, we turn to random exploration of the search space, and to do so, we start by randomly generating lists of parameter sets, we execute them on three GPUs, in our case one NVIDIA, one AMD, and one Intel, six litmus tests in total, and then we statistically examine the results. And through this process, we developed a data set of 18 million total iterations, and that includes over 154 hours of total testing time. And we use this exploratory data set to drive our optimizations. Now, while our full paper goes into much more depth in this regard, I'll, I'll give you a quick taste of what this analysis looks like. We're going to start by looking at a set of 1,000 random parameter sets executed for 10,000 iterations over each GPU and each test. Now we see here the percent of the parameter sets that exposed at least one weak behavior in 10,000 iterations, split by test in each column and by GPU in each chart. We can immediately see why the challenge is so tough. The results vary hugely across different tests and different GPUs, despite the parameter sets being identical indicating that different parameters have different effectiveness depending on the scenario. Now we see a histogram of exposure rates for parameter sets that exposed at least one weak behavior. We can again see the vast majority of sets expose weak behaviors at very low rates, posing challenges to both efficiency and reproducibility. Our aim here is essentially to quickly find the parameter sets that appear at the far right of each histogram, that is, the most effective parameter sets for each GPU. This brings us to our next question. How can we efficiently expose weak behaviors? And we call this process tuning. Now effective stress is often elusive. If we look back to our first graph, we see that only 2.6% of random parameter sets were at all effective on the SB test for the AMD Vega chip. In our case, we explored for 154 hours total. Uh, it's clear that a naive, fully random search is infeasible for time reasons. Long story short here is we need optimizations. Now intuitively, we would like to avoid unnecessary iterations of testing. 
We can actually do this by simply stopping when we're statistically confident through confidence intervals that the current parameter set, which is randomly generated, is ineffective. This technique, which is called data peaking, actually showed huge speed ups. And you can see that here. Uh, this chart demonstrates the average progress of data peaking versus a full count method. And we actually saw almost 130 hours of speed up out of the 154 hour total with no real loss in effectiveness. Now there's an important but easily overlooked consideration here and that is what does it mean for a given parameter set to be good? We introduce what we call scoring techniques to frame this question. Now intuitively we can classify goodness as the number of weak behaviors a parameter set exposes and we call this approach maximum frequency sum or MFS. MFS is simple and it's intuitive, but it can overweight outliers. And the key here is that for a given parameter set, exposing some weak behaviors in many scenarios, that is across many GPUs and many tests, is more important than exposing lots of weak behaviors in one scenario, as we can eliminate testing time and bookkeeping overhead by reusing one tuned parameter set rather than finding a whole lot of parameter sets for a bunch of different scenarios. Instead of MFS, we introduce other techniques, such as using the log of the number of weak behaviors and also introducing a floor to eliminate ineffective parameter sets. And we explore all these optimizations and several more in our paper in a whole lot more depth. And the short story is that we're really excited by the way that these can bypass some of the trade-offs that have thus far kept the academic approach and the industry approach so far apart. Now we've talked about our novel methods and it's time to see if they work and what they mean for existing test suites if they do. Now we have to remember that the ultimate goal here is to find bugs, but like we mentioned before, the weak behaviors we've been looking at are normally allowed. The question is then, how can we use this test paradigm to find bugs? We do so through a process called conformance testing. What that looks like is we start by adding OpenCL memory fence annotations to our tests that disallow the weak behaviors. We execute these modified tests with the tune parameter sets that we found earlier in our exploratory data, and then we look at the results. Now, any weak behavior observed is a bug. Through this process, we actually identified and reported a previously unknown issue in Intel's OpenCL compiler that resulted in an official patch. Uh, as this issue was undetected by official testing methods, we were super excited to quickly see real-world results for our tools, especially on such a widely used implementation as OpenCL. While current industry testing methods are ineffective, they don't have to be. The current Vulkan Conformance Test Suite, which is a modern graphics API with broad and expanding use, has only two litmus tests, and it executes no stress alongside those tests. While the current state was driven in large part by this trade-off between efficiency and effectiveness, we believe our results can mitigate this trade-off, and to that end we provide several concrete recommendations. These include the addition of stress, which we found to be a key factor in observing any bugs at all. The addition of several litmus tests, which we found to be especially effective in finding bugs. And also the initiation of a data aggregation effort, wherein large test campaigns, similar to ours, can be run once and then analyzed to find effective, efficient testing methods and parameter sets. Now, there's a lot more analysis and statistical exploration from our paper that we've left out today, but let's reiterate our main conclusions. Firstly, tunable stress is an absolute requirement to see bugs in any sort of efficient manner across these scenarios. Second, testing and tuning doesn't need to be impossibly inefficient. We've found ways to test that are efficient, effective, and portable. And finally, and honestly most importantly, issues do exist in current GPU and compiler implementations, and the existing test approaches will not find them. Our hope is that the analysis and the recommendations we've included here can move GPU memory testing uh, one step closer to being effective, to being efficient, and most importantly, being usable. 
Once again, my name is Jake Kirkham. Feel free to reach out with any lingering questions. And thank you all so much for watching. Have a great conference.